Hey, thanks for checking out the Nikhil Hogan Show. If you like the content, you can subscribe to it on most major podcast platforms, YouTube or Facebook. I'm also writing a book on music education called Why Children Quit Music. And you can check out my website, NikhilHogan.com, for updates on when it's going to be released. If you're a parent who's interested in learning how best to help your children learn music, you can check out my company, SongbirdMusicAcademy.com. And there are a ton of free articles links and resources for Neapolitan Partimento-based learning, and also the Barry Harris Method if you're interested in learning jazz. Now, let's get to the show. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Nikhil Hogan Show. My guest today is Professor Nicholas Baraguanath. He is a scholar of music theory and history. His book, The Italian Traditions and Puccini, a major study of compositional theory and practice in the 19th century Italy, was published in 2011 by Indiana University Press. His upcoming book, The Solfeggio Tradition of Forgotten Art, of Melody in the Long 18th Century will be released by Oxford University Press in the summer of 2020. Professor Baraguanath, it's really an honor to have you on the show. Well, thanks very much for having me. Now, before we begin, could you tell me a little bit about your background in music? Um, yeah, I studied as a pianist. So uh, I left school at the age of 15. I went straight to the Royal Academy of Music in London, uh, and I trained as a pianist until about the age of 21, um, when I decided that it wasn't quite for me, and I went into academia. In academia, what was your area of research? Um, well, I've pretty much covered all bases. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I don't have any school qualifications and um, I only got a degree by default because I actually took several courses and they allowed me to take a degree when I wasn't allowed to get one because uh, I, I was a pianist. <laughs> um, and then after that, I went for a, a, a PhD scholarship and uh, happened to get it. And that's what got me into academia. <laughs> um, and I, I started off as an Alban Berg scholar. Um, and I've basically worked my way backwards. So I've published on all kinds of stuff. I've done uh, aesthetics and critical theory of the 1930s. I've done Alban Berg in the second Viennese school. I've gone back through Wagner, through romantic music, um, uh, ended up in uh, with Puccini I've written about, you know, Italian opera. Yes. Uh, and I've, I've gone further and further back, essentially. Um, <laughs> and now I'm sort of reaching right back into the medieval period in some of my recent work. Uh, that's fantastic. Now, of, of course, everyone is really excited. Everyone's been asking me, when are you going to get Nicholas on the show? Because <clears throat> the book is getting quite a lot of attention. And so let me ask you, what sources, uh, so the book is The Solfeggio Tradition, and how did you find your way into this topic? When I did the book on Puccini, I basically, uh, the book on Puccini uh, was meant to be a study of him and his operas, uh, but my very first chapter was going to be his educational background. And when I started doing chapter one, I realized I knew absolutely nothing about what Puccini learned. And so the entire book became the chapter one, if you like. It became Puccini's education and his uh, compositional background in these kind of Italian traditions, which have been largely forgotten. And actually, during that research, I realized how little we knew, me and everyone else included, about these long Italian traditions. So I started to look back, you know, uh, into the 18th century to see where, where this stuff came from. And I found these things called solfeggi. And if you go to European archives, you'll find tens of thousands of these things. I mean, they're very, very common, but nobody has ever written about them. No one's researched them and no one really knows what they do or did. Um, and so I set myself a very simple question about nine years ago. I said, OK, what what are all these manuscripts? What what did they do? What did they teach? How were they used? Why are there so many of them? And can I interpret and understand them? So I started there about nine years ago. It's been a really long nine years. Um, I spent <laughs> most of it uh, in archives dredging around ancient manuscripts. And um, I'm happy to say that I think I cracked the code, that I have actually worked out what these things are for. And the answer's were extremely surprising, I have to say. When it comes to Partimenti, there are few authentic realizations of Partimenti, but by contrast, do we have many examples of the solfeggi in their full form? Every solfeggio is pretty much in its full form, yes. <laughs> so um, uh, it's, it, it's an incredible story. I mean, um, one thing I will say that, that listeners might be surprised at is that no uh, 18th century Italian musician was ever allowed near a keyboard until they'd done at least three years of solfeggio. 
And so, so Parti Mentor was not a basic study. It was uh, for a select chosen few who were deemed good enough or suitable to, to, to learn the keyboard. And it was a completely different system because it, it, it has different functions. It has a different purpose playing the keyboard. Um, so uh, the first three or more, lit literally a minimum of three years, they would spend doing solfeggio. And then, then they would say, well, you're going to be a singer or you're going to play the keyboard or you're going to be a composer. And, and that's when they would specialize. But the solfeggio training was the basic training training and it's the one that's never been written about before when it comes to parlamenti we have fenaroli and forno and those rules do, for solfeggio what sources and uh, do we have treatises of how to do solfeggio in the italian manner um sort of uh the thing is uh, solfeggio is it, uh, another thing i want to get clear from the start is that solfeggio is nothing like any modern solfeggio. So any listeners who are thinking, well, I know about Kodai method or movable dough or fixed dough or whatever, it's nothing like those. It's, it's not the same as those at all. It's called the same, but it's not the same. That's the first thing to mention. Um, we don't have a treatise because it was a, a craft secret. This was a, a, um, a, a secret method that was taught orally by, by uh, maestro to student. Um, and the, in fact, the Germans used to complain about this quite a lot. They used to say they were excluded from this art, you know, and get quite sore about it. So we don't have a treatise. Um, but what we do have, uh, we, we have lots and lots of sources which tell us which syllables to use. So the solmization method is pretty clear. That's, that's incontestable, really, uh, the amount of sources we have. The uh, secrets of how these things were actually sung, that's very difficult. And in fact, and I can tell you the story of how I discovered this, okay. uh, if you want. It's quite, it's quite a yes, weird story. Of so if you look at a solfeggio manuscript, so they look like melodies. So it could just be like any, any 18th century melody. It could be in the style of an aria or a sonata or a fugue. It could be literally anything. And it's a complete melody with, with a bass line usually. It doesn't have to have a bass line. Um, so it's very difficult to interpret. You'd think, well, it's a melody. What do you do? You sing it? You play it? I mean, what? The secret, of course, is in how these things were sung and put together. The, the, the secret to the solfeggio tradition is knowing that uh, music education in the 18th century was primarily geared towards churches. And this is something we tend to forget because we focus on theatres and glamorous courts and this kind of thing. But actually, the number of all the schools were church schools. Uh, if your daddy wasn't a Kapellmeister and your family weren't musicians, then you learned in church schools. That was what happened. Um, and church schools, of course, had one main objective, was, which was to produce choir boys and girls and produce cantors and people for church music. So the very first thing they learned was um, plain chant. And this is something that's been totally forgotten. But all of the primers, all the sort of basic rules and guides and primers for kids to learn music are plain chant manuals. Uh, and they're written in a 13th century medieval notation that they have four line staves and they, staffs and, and they have um, square note heads. And this was totally current in Italy right up through the 19th century. If you go to church schools where Puccini was learning, they still had medieval notation and plain chant. And that's what you learned to do your church music. Did they use um, do? Did they use ut instead of do? No, they never sang ut instead of do um, because it's horrible to sing. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the earliest known mention of do is actually from a guy called uh, Doni, uh, D-O-N-I, in 1640. And people say that it's actually the first syllable of his name, Doni. <laughs> so he, he, he invented the first syllable of his name so instead of ut because he didn't like ut. But um, it, they, they were probably singing it even before then because it's just nicer to sing. Uh, but yes, they sang do, re, mi. Um, the, the thing is, uh, they use the old medieval hexachords, and they absolutely use these, there's no doubt about that, right the way through the 18th century. Now, here I'm going to, uh, I'll say, uh, I'm hopefully going to stagger you with a few little facts here. I'm already and here's staggered. Here's the first one. Here's the first one, really. All right. Uh, if, uh, what happened is, when I started studying the sources, I realized that the textbook or treatise was actually the plain chart manuals. I had to learn those before I could understand what was going on, so I did. Um, I trained myself as a puer cantor, a, a choir boy, an 18th century choir boy, and I sang through all these plain chant manuals. And I realized something which I've uh, since proven, and I've discussed it and shown it to many other musicians. Uh, in the 18th century, musicians could read 84 combinations of key signatures and clefs with just two patterns. Two patterns. So, you know, nowadays in solfeggio, you have to learn your alto clef and your tenor That's clef. Right. And, you know, the seven clefs. 
It's just impossible. I mean, imagine a, a baritone clef in B major, and then it suddenly shifts to a tenor clef in, uh, you know, A flat major. It's almost impossible for us nowadays to do this. For an 18th century musician, there were only two patterns on the stave, only two. You only learn two patterns, like we would learn, for instance, treble and bass, and you could read all 84 combinations with just those two patterns. Wait a second. So wait, hold on a second. What do you mean by 84? Because I just think of seven, seven times 12. So, so seven clefs, 12 key signatures. Oh, okay. So, any clef, any clef, right. any key signature. So uh, any clef, any key signature could be read with just one of two patterns. Um, it's astonishing. It's the most incredible system. The way to know this is to do plain chant. Okay, wait, hold on a second. So this seems completely different from like, like you mentioned how people now think of solfeggio as just singing exercises, sight singing. Yeah, it's not that at all. It's not that at all in the 18th century. Now, let me ask you this question, which I think would, some people have asked me to ask, which is if someone has absolute or perfect pitch where like, for instance, A is 440, are they going to be bothered by this new system? Um, that's a good question. Uh, probably yes, because it's a, it's a system for singing. Um, and actually, when uh, what happened is when they'd done their three years of solfeggio for singing, they'd learned this system of reading clefs where you can basically read any clef. Um, and it doesn't matter what the pitch is, because in, in church choirs, a cappella, for instance, it never mattered what the pitch was. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't really matter. But um, when you get to sort of three or four years after solfeggio, and let's say you're going to learn the violin, you suddenly then get given the violin clef. And the reason for that is, of course, that it, you have to know where G is to know the G string. So uh, the, the clefs were for instruments. You know, each each clef was uh, created for a specific set of instruments. And of course, then you do have to know the letter name and the pitch. But for singing, it doesn't matter. So it was completely movable. So it does have some similarities to movable dough then in a big way. Yes, it does. But it's hexachordal. So it is a movable dough system, but it uses a hexachord system based on the medieval hexachords. Now, hexachord means six notes. What hap How did we suddenly have seven notes with C or T? That's a really long question. <laughs> uh, the, the, well, the, the, that's a really long question. I mean, the, there has always been an octave in music. So, uh, you know, in, in the letter names, in the modes, uh, you know, there, there's been seven note scales in music history going way back into the medieval period. But the modern, the, the partimento seven note scale, the one that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the bass, is very, very recent. And in fact, the earliest mentions we have are around about 1715. And we don't really have mentions of it before then. Um, it probably was around uh, in the 17th century as an octave scale in the bass, but it's very strongly connected to keyboard music and learning to play chords from bass notes. Uh, in uh, in solfeggio, they use six syllable hexachords. And for those listeners who are not familiar with this, it's very simple. It's the first six notes of a scale. So it's do, re, mi, fa, sol, la. It just doesn't have the seven notes. And the reason for that, this is going to, you know, this is, people think, well, why bother with something so complex? Um, it's because if you have your scale made up of two six note scales instead of one seven note scale, in other words, your, your scale outlines a tenth uh, from the tonic to the third or the tenth above. Um, then the letter names remain the same in any part of the scale. So if I say do, re, mi, I can also go do, re, mi in a different part of the scale and, and the letters stay the same. So once you've learned one pattern, it never has to change. Think, for instance, if I use modern scale degree numbers and I sing six, five, four, three, I then have to sing three, two, one, seven, which makes no sense. In the 18th century, it was la, sol, fa, mi, la, sol, fa, mi. They both had the same, the interval pattern had the same letters, uh, uh, syllables. So it's a wonderful system of learning. Now, how are modes such as the Ionian, Dorian, Aeolian, are they relevant to solfeggio? No, uh, is the quick answer to that. Uh, the, the, the modes were used uh, in Italy. I mean, I'm not going to talk for other traditions because I know in Germany they were considered slightly more important. Uh, this is a very complex history. Uh, if anyone's interested, the way Johann Fuchs uh, notates his minor keys will tell you what you need to know about German use of modes compared to the Italian. The Italians use modes only for one reason, and that was to classify chants in church services. So the modes themselves, and again, I'm going to say something hopefully that will be very provocative and surprising, but in 18th century Italy, they never ever sang the modes. The, the Phrygian mode, the one starting on E, never had a Phrygian second. It was always E to F sharp. The uh, Lydian mode on F never ever had a Lydian fourth because the B was always flattened. Uh, so the modes 
existed in name only. They were always sounding like major and minor scales in Italy. And again, that's something which is absolutely incontrovertible. If you go to any guide to plane chant published in uh, 18th century Italy, it will tell you this. It will tell you that you do ne- you never, ever sing the Dorian mode without a C sharp, for instance. In your research looking at the archival material, what are the key differences among the solfeggi of the 17th, 18th and the 19th centuries? How did you notice the change as the centuries moved forward? Okay, well, for one thing, we don't, we have very, very few 17th century solfeggi. Um, the solfeggio, uh, as we, there are many types of solfeggio. I mean, I, I've got to be careful. I don't want to get bogged down in detail here. But the kind of solfeggio people are familiar with, with a with a melody and a bass line, that uh, stems from the late 16th century, and it's very much tied up with uh, monody and basso continuo. So the the solo song, you know, the kind of uh, solo song you get in Caccini and Monteverdi, this kind of thing. Um, and initially, the first solfeggi were actually arias where you would simply have a, a sketch of the aria and you would teach the aria with the sketch. So just like the basso seguente for partimento, uh, the solfeggio started off as a kind of reduction of an actual piece. And only later did it turn into a kind of pedagogical method. Uh, of, of you know writing bespoke exercises and we don't really know when that happened i mean the other big difference is there are there are two solfeggio traditions there's the richer car or the contrapuntal one which has roots in uh, sun counterpoint goes way back into the renaissance uh, and beyond and the other one is the aria solfeggio which really stems from the early 17th century and which is to do with this kind of solo song with a bass accompaniment and the two are quite different traditions that they, they kind of uh, go in parallel. And then in the 18th century, they, they sort of hybridize into solfeggio fugues of various sorts. Uh, solfeggio, as people seem to know it now, are just happen to be these melodies. Does Is Italian solfeggio always tied with a bass line? No, it's not. And in fact, um, the, 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 this is a huge topic because many maestros, for instance, um, talk about singing without the bass and then with the bass. Uh, others, uh, there, there are editions of solo solfeggi which have the words, you know, this sounds better with a bass. So they would add a bass, for instance. It's a very fluid tradition. Um, and it, I think it depended on didactic need. So whatever the teacher wanted to teach, it either had a bass or didn't have a bass. And it could have different types of bass as well. Studying counterpoint through solfeggio, how did, how did they study counterpoint and even composition through this art of solfeggio? Okay, I'm gonna. This is this is where I uh, enter into my own. I'm gonna have to sing for you or do a few things here. Sure. Um, <laughs> the um, for one thing, the the teaching of counterpoint through singing has a very long history, and in fact, uh, anyone can uh, look me up on this and catch me out, but. Right into the 19th century, professors of counterpoint at music conservatoires were also professors of singing. The two were the same subject right up until the end of the 19th century. Uh, and that's something which surprises us because singing teachers nowadays, you don't <laughs> expect them to be teaching counterpoint yeah, for some right. reason. But counterpoint and singing were always completely tied together in the Italian uh, traditions. The reason for that is, of course, that you can memorize uh, syllable names much easier than any other way. So if, if I tell you that fa mi fa can go against a do re mi, you'll remember that. Uh, and that's a very simple bit of invertible counterpoint. So I can have do re mi and against it I said fa mi fa. And that makes a nice little bit of counterpoint. And they're, of course, much more complex uh, combinations. So uh, the syllables were instrumental in learning com- how to combine melodies. But I haven't got to the really main point yet as to how these things taught composition. So uh, let me know if you want me to tell you about oh, that. Oh, please. No, no, go ahead. Uh, okay. So the crucial thing about a solfeggio is how you sing it. Now, in the early stages of training, you would basically sing a solfeggio, which was note for note syllables. So like a plain chant, in other words. So if you can think of a very simple plain chant like do, re, mi, re, do, that's a simple, uh, you know, melody, isn't it? Note for note. Uh, Now, they were only... They were only ever sung like that, if ever, in the very first days of lessons. So students very quickly stopped doing that. Uh, They would read the syllables without singing them for, for, for quite some time to learn to score read. But when they started singing the syllables, you sang musically or with graces. So you would never sing do, re, mi, because that's not music. You would do something to it. So you might, for instance, uh, phrase it differently. And this was called fraseggio puro, or pure phrasing. So I might, for instance, sing do, do, re, 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 mi, or I could do something like do, re, 
re mi maybe something like that or do re re mi or do re mi re mi fa so you start to phrase things in musical ways just to jump in really quickly the solfege di italy was that massive publication in france where they kind of compiled all of these solfeggio for the french population and the editor said at the end of it that it's getting so difficult that you might as well just sing la it, it, if what you're saying is true is it maybe they they would actually have one syllable for multiple notes at a time. Okay, now, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, the Solfège d'Italie was published for amateurs. It was an amateur thing. And it, was, uh, it had a very simplified, uh, simplified uh, solemnization system, the one we use, uh, use in Paris nowadays with the seventh uh, syllable C. And it was for teaching amateurs to read music because there was a huge new amateur market. And what they needed, because there were cheap printed scores around, was how to read these scores. And Solfège d'Italie was to cater to that market. Um, there's been quite a bit of research done on this uh, recently. Uh, so it has uh, almost nothing to do with the Italian solfeggio tradition for pr pr professionals. So uh, the Solfege d'Italie was a compilation of genuine solfeggi. They're, they're real solfeggi by Italian masters, but they're presented for amateur French market to learn to read music. So they're absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> right. Could you elaborate a little bit more? I interrupted you. You, you, were singing, you were singing Do and Re, but you were adding stuff to that syllable. Yeah, so the first thing you do is you learn to phrase the, the syllables in patterns. So um, if I sing, for instance, la, sol, fa, mi, that's a really boring phrase. If I did something like this, sol, la, la, sol, sol, fa, fa, mi, can you see I've already turned it into music, but it's the same pattern. So you learn lots of patterns like that, first of all. Then it gets interesting because then you learn what are called leaps, and the leaps are intervals. So I can, for instance, put a leap of the third on everything, do, re, me or I can do do re mi uh, and you can put different leaps on on the syllables you can put uh, appoggiaturas for instance do re re mi those are chromatic appoggiaturas I can do uh, cerca della nota which is a kind of big appoggiatura so for instance do re mi that's a, a kind of cerca della nota a search for the note and there are thousands literally tens of thousands of ways. So if I were to teach you how to sing Do, Re, Mi in solfeggio, we would spend around six years doing nothing but that. Wait, six, six years, not three years? Well, three years for the basics, if you went on to be a partimentist or whatever. If you were going to be a great singer then, or a great violinist, then you spent six years doing solfeggio, at least six years. What is the difference between basic lettura or note reading and mm -hmm. l'art del canto, meaning solfeggio <laughs> cantato meant with graces? Yes, that's right. So uh, solfeggio parlato is spoken solfeggio, and that's uh, they used to read music from the stave and beat time with their hand. And this was basically to learn to read music, and they would speak it so they didn't sing it pitch, they just spoke the syllables. So you, you would look at the stave and you would say do, re, mi, fa, sol, and then you would just beat them in pitch so you were absolutely able to read any staff any kind of music uh, and they, they used to do this before the voice broke because they didn't like training voices before they broke and so these poor kids until they were sort of 11 or something would have to just speak syllables it must have been incredibly boring uh, as soon as you start to sing them solfeggio cantato that's a different thing solfeggio cantato is when you sing the syllables and you would never sing a plain syllable uh, you know all the, anyone who knows anything about singing treaties know that you sing with graces you sing with ornaments with um, um, accent with you know and that's what it meant so you you don't sing do re mi you sing something else you sing do re mi you sing something that's musical in a certain style and these were taught by the maestro so the maestro would uh, literally speak the syllables in certain styles and the student would copy so it's an oral tradition and I can, uh, I can, for instance, teach you in the space of probably 40 seconds to compose a sonata exposition in this, in this method. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. So if, if we take a really simple pattern of syllables. Now, listeners who are not familiar with do, re, mi's, they might get a bit freaked about this. So <laughs> if you think of them as one, two, three, four, five, six, there are only six syllables. That's it. One, you can number them if you want. You can sing one, two, three instead of do, re, mi. It's the same thing. So if I sing a pattern of syllables, a really simple one, we'll have a theme that goes one, seven, one. That's a soprano cadence. One, seven, one. Yep. 
And then we have a, an answering phrase, a, a sort of riposte, which would be six, five, four, three. And then we have a cadence, which would be two. That's a half cadence on two, which is re, a half cadence. Uh, we've got three things there, a theme, a continuation, and a cadence. Are you ready? Now I'm gonna, I could sing it in all sorts of different ways. So we could put a, a leap of a fifth on the fa. Fa, ha, ha, mi, fa. Now are you ready for this? I'm gonna sing it as a sonata exposition. Just those syllables, just the ones I've done. Fa, ha, ha, mi, fa. Okay. La, sol, fa, <laughs> mi. La, sol, fa, mi. Re, la, sol, fa, mi, re, mi, re, mi, re. Can you see how it works? So. I've just uh, sung a, so a sonata exposition by Mozart. It only has those syllables, it has no others. That's all it is, it's just simple phrasing. I hope you understand now that I can teach my students to write a sonata in a matter of minutes <laughs> by doing this. So it's so much easier than doing bass lines and modulations and harmonies and, and form and all the rest. You just get a simple pattern of syllables and you sing it in different ways. Uh, and you can create music very, very quickly. That's how they did it. How does this relate to schematic prototypes in this music schema theory? Would they be familiar with things like the printer and that sort of thing in Italy? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it, it relates perfectly to that. In fact, it, it backs up um, Bob Jerdingen's theory completely. Uh, so uh, Bob Jerdingen, of course, was using partimenti as, as historical evidence for his uh, schemata. Um, but actually, of course, they first came from solfeggio because solfeggio was taught before partimento. So the students would have, they would have known a printer, for instance, was a kind of la sol fa mi. Um, so yes, uh, the, the schemata that Bob Jerningen identified can absolutely correspond to the reality of solfeggio singing, but not quite. So for instance, it's extremely rare to just have la sol fa mi in a solfeggio. It's nearly always slightly more complex. For instance, sol la sol, sol fa mi, it will be grouped in different ways. If somebody is wanting to know the differences, they'd have to look at a lot of solfeggi to see how they kind of put that together? Uh, yes. <laughs> the only way to learn solfeggio is that this is what happened. When I started researching this, I spent two years looking at these manuscripts and uh, getting absolutely nowhere, just analyzing them and, and getting no answers at all. Um, and then I decided that the reason was that I didn't actually know anything, that my knowledge of music theory and history was completely useless. And so I thought, well, I'm going to have to become an apprentice. So what I did was um, I got thousands of solfeggio manuscripts and photocopied them. And I had huge piles of these things in my study. And I started singing. I put them on the piano and I just started singing through them. And I sang through hundreds of these things. And after several months, I started to work it out. It starts to make sense. So, so I actually trained myself as an apprentice to be able to do this. What was the trickiest thing for you starting out doing this? The trickiest thing was to find evidence of how they um, sang one syllable to many notes, because uh, this, this was a secret. Um, and it's, it's all written in my book, and, and, but I'm just going to tell everyone already because I don't care. Um, <laughs> but basically, I, for a long time, I knew that they had to be singing multiple notes to a syllable because it was completely stupid and impossible to sing every note to a syllable, as everyone knows. Uh, but I just didn't know how they did that. And then um, uh, it came with the word Amen, bizarrely. So I, I often wondered why German sources uh, sang their solfeggi to the word Amen. Uh, so they would put an A on the beginning and then an Amen at the end. Ah, the whole thing's Ah, and then you just say Men. And I thought, well, why bother with Amen? I mean, these are not, you know, <laughs> why, why not just Ah? Or why not another word with a, an R in it? Um, and then I found in several earlier sources, they talk about singing notes like Amens. And it's because, of course, in plain chant and in church services, the one word that always gets a melisma is Amen. <laughs> so uh, uh, if you think of a plain chant, you'd sing your plain chant. It could be totally syllabic. And then at the end, ah, Amen, there's a, there's a melisma on Amen. And so they used to talk about singing notes like Amens. And then I worked it out. These were little Amens, uh, you know, to sing like an Amen. Um, so I went back to the um, manuscripts and I looked for evidence and I found it. Uh, I found that in the manuscripts, these markings have been overlooked. No one had ever noticed them before. But if you look at a solfeggio manuscript, they quite often have little straight lines above the, the, the notes. 
And you could mistake them for slurs, but they're a lot straighter. They're sort of straight lines rather than curly ones. These are called tratti. They're traits, traits of vocalization. And they've got nothing to do with um, uh, slurring or phrasing. They show you where one syllable ends and another begins. And they only wrote them in the manuscripts where there was an ambiguity. So normally the students, because they were trained really from uh, simple basics through to advanced, they didn't need any markings. But we do. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes in a manuscript, there was an ambiguity. So a, a singer, there might be two ways to do a passage. So they would actually write in the traits above the melody to show where the syllables changed. And uh, I started to write in the syllables when I saw these markings and every single one worked. It all, they all corresponded perfectly with, with the melody and the syllables. So I'd found the evidence. Uh, there is evidence in the scores as to how they did this. Um, and basically, the worse the singer, the more markings there were in the manuscript. So for genuine Neapolitan singers, there are no markings at all. Uh, when you get manuscripts copied for other places, they start to get lots of markings. Put in. <laughs> so the German ones have the best. The German ones have loads of markings. I'm just so blown away by the fact that singers are so such comprehensive musicians. I mean, that would be absurd today. No offense to singers, of course, but <laughs> but I mean, just like I was so stunned that people like Popora and Farinelli just were able to do this complicated stuff. Let's go on to pedagogy for today now. Now, if I'm interested. Let's say by royal decree, you were in charge of solfeggio training for children all over the world. Now, how would you start this from the very beginning? Well, I mean, there's a good question there as to whether we should be doing this again. I mean, you know, that's a, that's for someone else to answer, maybe. But I mean, um, how this is mined and used and used for benefiting modern education, this is something I leave to uh, experts in pedagogy um, because I, I don't have the answers. I don't know exactly how to revive this or to uh, use parts of it or whatever. But if, if we were teaching it properly, if we were teaching it as it was taught in the 18th century, it has to be taught like a language. So it, it's, not, it's, it's not a textbook thing. It's got to be practical. So the very first thing you'd have to teach would be score reading and score reading using hexachords and uh, far clefs of plain chant, because then you can read every clef, every key signature with just two patterns. Um, I know how to do that, but I still find it difficult because I've been trained in the, the modern way. Uh, so whether we want to do that, probably not. But that's the first lesson. Then when a student has been able to read music, and so we could take that for granted and just say, look, let's just stick to treble and bass clefs, modern C major. Let's just do that. What we would start with is uh, the six syllables and putting them into simple patterns of phrases. Um, and that actually teaches rhythm and phrasing and form. So if you say to a student, look, let's take the notes do, re, mi. What can you do with those? You can spend hours putting those three notes in different patterns and, and different shapes. And then when you get the six notes, and then you, when you put the fa above la, the, se the little semitone above la, which you're allowed to use in solfeggio, you can pretty much make any melody. So the first thing to do is how to put those notes into melodies in rhythms. The next thing, of course, is how to sing them. And you start very, very simply. So you'd say, let's do a melody with some leaps of the third. Do, re, mi, yep. Leaps of the third the other way, filling them in. Do, re, mi, he. Those are filled in leaps of the third. We then start to do some ornaments like turn figures. Do, re, mi, he. We might do uh, poggiaturas. We might do trills. We could do all sorts of stuff like that. And the, the system gradually builds up more and more complexity. And I've done this with students. I've taught my own students at university over a period of about six, seven weeks. And I can promise you now they are composing beautiful melodies, uh, you know, in the style of 18th century maestros. Um, and, and you can't really go wrong when you do it because you just know what sounds right and what doesn't. And you can learn counterpoint, too, very, very quickly. You can learn really quite advanced counterpoint very quickly. Uh, so if you, for instance, know that the, so, the syllables la, sol, fa, mi compare with fa, mi, re, do, which is a printer, basically, and then, then you start to sing them in different ways. So instead of, for instance, la, sol, if I sing, I'll do a, an advanced one for you. La, la, sol. You'll find that that will actually pair with someone else singing the same things in, in counterpoint. And we can create really astonishing counterpoint fugues within minutes, literally a matter of minutes in the lessons. That's amazing. Now, with your knowledge now, how do you look at scores now? Of, I mean, you're, you're a trained pianist. Do you look at your old piano scores a little differently? 
well, I can't listen to the music in the same way anymore. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I one one yeah one thing that I do hear, which people might be again, I'm, I'm going to try and throw something provocative out there. Uh, people don't seem to realize this, but musica ficta was alive and well in the 18th century. So if you're, uh, by that I mean uh, unnotated accidentals that were added in performance. So the, the, I, I know the real meaning of musica ficta, so don't write in. Uh, but for, for present purposes, what I mean is unnotated, you know, singing an accidental that isn't written. Um, and they did this. So if you learn plain chant, it, it comes very naturally because in plain chant, you do it all the time. It's one of the basic things in plain chant. You have to add accidentals to get rid of dodgy intervals, this sort of thing. And they were very, very used to this. So in a solfeggio, they would uh, sharpen sub-semitones, they would uh, mitigate tritones, they would do all sorts of the stuff that Renaissance scholars know about, and they still did it. And I found that in solfeggio manuscripts, the ones that are for apprentices in Naples hardly have any accidentals in, very few sharps. When the same solfeggio was copied for lessons in Vienna or Paris, suddenly there's all sorts of sharps and flats in there. And the evidence suggests that, well, they must have sung them. They must have done this, but without notating. And the, the evidence of this is there plain and simple in, in plain chants. It tells you to do that. So I conclude that in a lot of 18th century music, especially early 18th century, we're actually missing a lot of accidentals. You've looked at so many scores and, and, and the, the archival material. What are the differences between the old style and, I guess, the newer popular style of Mozart? Like, for, for instance, the strict style, the, the, older, the older, more church-like. And I, and I guess as we get more into the popular style of quote-unquote classical Yeah, music. I mean, this, this is really complicated and it's as complicated as it is in music history. So, uh, for instance, um, it depends what the music's for. So uh, a composer like Mozart, for instance, if, he, if he's needed to write in the old-fashioned stile antico strict style for church, he can do that. And if he's needed to write something funny and gallant and up-to-date, he can do that too. Um, the syllabic uh, underpinning, the, the solfeggio underpinning remains the same. Um, so, I mean, it's incredible, but a La Solfami is a printer, which could be a very gallant Farinelli style printer, or it could be part of a fugue. Um, it could be uh, in counterpoint as a fugue. And it's the same. It's the same substratum, if you like. So it's really a matter of musical style, and it's a matter of the expertise of the performer stroke composer. So anybody can say La Sol Fa Mi, that's not difficult. But to say La Sol Fa Mi in the, as many ways as Mozart could say it, <laughs> that's difficult. Or in as many ways as Bach could say it. Did you have choral training when you in your musical development? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I go right through the British choral tradition, which is a wonderful apprenticeship. So, yeah, all the way through school, I was in school choirs and I sang every bass, every voice part as my voice went through the, the, the breaking process. And yes, yeah, so I, I, I learned um, a lot of repertoire, school reading, harmonization. You know, yes, I did go through the choral tradition and, and I was a conservatoire from the age of 15. So uh, I had a lot of musical training. Let me ask you about the, the reception of the Italian solfeggio. This is a music history question. How is it thought of in other countries like France and Vienna and Germany? Surely, I mean, it, Italian music was dominant at that in that century. Even though they kept it a secret, where people were listening to them perform, did they? What was the reception of it outside of Italy? Well, I mean, the the solfeggio tradition was a, a, a professional craft training, so so it it only exists in professional circles, which we call conservatoires or church chapels or whatever. Um, I mean, the, the word solfeggio was known um, and it was used later in the 18th century as a marketing tool. So the solfege d'Italie, for instance, that's a marketing name because it's saying to people, you know, those castrati and those great Italian singers, you too could sing like this you know, <laughs> if you buy this book, basically what it means. Um, but I, we, we know this story. I mean, Bob Jerningham's talked about this, how in the 18th century, the famous uh, musicians were all Italians you know, uh, and we forget them, you know, we forget their names. But the great uh, names, if you asked anyone in Europe who are the great musicians, they'd, they'd name Italians. They wouldn't name others. <laughs> I wanted to ask if you had been collaborating or at least uh, sharing notes with people in historical performance, uh, people who sing 18th century and 17th century and, and earlier music and showed them your notes. And what has been the reception of your research? Um, generally, I have tried to do that, but because the book isn't published yet, people generally think I'm mad. Uh, so, so whenever I talk, I mean, I'm talking about this with you now, and most people will think I'm completely crazy and just making all this up. But um, I do have a sort of 500 page book coming out, which gives a lot of evidence for it. Um, so hopefully that will you know, back it up a little bit. Um, but 
because I don't have the research published, when I talk about it, people tend to be very skeptical. Um, but I have taught people this. I have taught it in uh, conservatoires in the Netherlands and in Belgium and in Switzerland. Um, I went uh, to the Royal Academy recently and taught the students there. Uh, the reception I generally get is one of fascination, but they uh, all say we want to know more about it. And what happens is I teach them and they say, well, this is fantastic. You know, we'd love to do this, but there's nothing for them to use to, to teach themselves. So the, the, the quicker I can get this stuff published, the better. Um, so I've got the book coming out, but the book is very much an academic book. It's it's to kind of ground the topic. And uh, it's for scholars to, to look at and say, well, is he right? Is he wrong? You know, where's he made mistakes and, and this kind of thing, which is fair enough. Um, but my next step will be a textbook for everybody. So I'm going to try and put this into a simplified step-by-step -step, lesson one, lesson two textbook so that, uh, for instance, a performer or a music teacher or a music student at any level can pick up the book and say, OK, I want to be able to do this. I want to understand this. And hopefully it will teach them. And I've worked out ways to do that. Now, to prepare for your book when it is published next year, what would you like interested musicians who are probably uh, wanting to sink their teeth into it. What do you think they should practice so that when they get the book, they're like ready to go into it? What's, what skills should they have in their back pocket? Well, the only, uh, the, the crucial skill is just knowing what a hexachord is. And the thing, this is a real stumbling block, you know, because we, we it's only uh, Medren scholars who really know about these things nowadays. Uh, but it's essential. It, it was the basis of 18th century music, the, the six note scale. Um, uh, seven note scale was the basis of Partimento, that's without doubt. But the six note scale was the basis of 18th century music education, certainly in Italy. Um, so I would advise them to get to know the Guido D'Arezzo system. It's not that difficult. All you have to know is that the scale is made up of two six-note scales, and they begin on the tonic and the dominant. So the first and the fifth notes of the scale are your do. There, there are two do, do syllables in the scale. So just getting familiar with that uh, would really help, because that's a real stumbling block for most modern musicians. Um, and uh, if... I, I want to go back to that whole perfect pitch thing. A lot of people, a lot of people try it with their kids. As they go, when their kids are really young, they go to the piano and say, "This is do, this is do," and they repeat it. And then over a period of time, they 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 sort of have this pitch memory or, or perfect pitch, so to speak. This is debatable, of course. But do you think in this way of learning solfeggio, um, that kind of pitch matching will be erased? Um, well, I, it's it's up to the way it's taught. I mean, um, I, I'm firmly convinced that uh, uh, so-called perfect pitch is simply a matter of memory, um, because I, I, you know I, I have perfect pitch like that. But it's purely because I spent so long playing the piano that I, if I imagine a keyboard in my head, I can hear the notes because yeah. you know, I, I memorize them. Yeah. Um, so it, it's completely the way it's taught. I mean, if if, if uh, the teacher wants to teach memorization of pitches, then that's perfectly feasible. I mean, the students in the 18th century, they did learn the gamut. So they did know the letter names too, because they had to be able to pinpoint pitch, pitches. Oh, so, okay. So I have a question for that. So the letter names, did they use Do or did they use C? Like the letter C? No, they C. had both. They had both. So they, the letters of Gregory, which are from the sort of 7th century, A, B, C, D, uh, uh, E, F, G, those seven letters are right there from the beginning of medieval music. Um, and they and they, they used to pinpoint pitches. So um, every note did have a letter name as well. So they would what they, the way they did it was, uh, if you wanted to name a note, you would name the letter and then all the syllables that could fall on that letter. So for instance, it would be C, Sol, Fa, Ut, because the letter C could have a Sol, it could have a a far and it could have an ut. So it was C, Sol, Fa, Ut. So that's how they named the letters. It's a very movable, doish sort of uh, perception, I guess. It developed over seven centuries of unbroken tradition. And so by the 1750s, it had been going for 700 years and uh, it had developed in incredible ways to become fully chromatic, uh, to, to accommodate chromaticism and key signatures. And I mean, it's, it's quite different from the medieval Renaissance systems. My next question is, this is for the long 18th century. And if we go into 19th century music, which is quote unquote progressive and chromatic and that sort of thing, is this system robust enough to accommodate the innovations of harmony that happen in the 19th and 20th century? No, <laughs> it's a simple answer to that. It died, it died, it died out. The, the last great practitioners of this system, this Italian solfeggio tradition, um, are Bellini and Paganini. Uh, 
it's that generation. So uh, we know that Bellini studied with Zingarelli at the Naples Conservatory. And we know from manuscript sources that he studied this old system, that he knew this system. Uh, so Bellini's melodies are very much within this tradition. And in fact, one could argue that later Italian opera keeps a lot of this shaping and this tradition. Um, but of course, elsewhere, it, it completely dies out. It, it, it dies out. I mean, I won't, uh, if you want, I'll talk about the reasons why it died yes, out. But yes, yes. In, um, in uh, composers in, in, in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, these kind of modern, progressive, uh, new types of music for amateur markets, um, these, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the old uh, craft system of the 18th century was completely inadequate for, for the developments that took place. I mean, it, even though Wagner studied with uh, the same teacher as Donizetti, a guy called uh, Mattei, um, uh, who knew the old system, the idea of l trying to work out Wagner's music by way of this 18th century craft system is nonsense. You know, clearly it won't fit. Uh, so, yes, it, it does die out. And no, the, the music of the 19th and 20th centuries, most of it will not fit with this system. It, it, it disappears. Now, that being said, it, this is still an incredibly powerful system. There's, there's works by Mozart that are incredibly dissonant as well. There is quite a lot of harmonic adventurism in, in for instance, part of mental studies with dissonance handling and that sort of thing. Does that show up in solfeggio as well? Incredibly dissonant melodies and, and handling dissonance? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a different traditions. I mean, in Bologna, they had a very contrapuntal tradition of solfeggio. And uh, there's some early 18th century ones which have solfeggi in whole tones, for instance, uh, 1740s. Um, if you go back even further than that, way back into the 17th century, there are all sorts of weird and bizarre chromatic and dissonant experiments with uh, uh, counterpoints and so on. So, I mean, this kind of thing has been going on since the Renaissance, really, these kind of weird uh, experiments. Um, but but solfeggio, uh, you know, I would say that, I mean, I haven't got time to tell you all the details now, but the solfeggio system could accommodate any complex chromaticism that, you know, it could handle anything. It just didn't because it wasn't very stylish. You know? <laughs> so, so it had, it, it was a craft. Uh, if you, I like to compare it to 18th century furniture making, you know, where beautiful craft traditions survive in different places. Uh, but of course there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And you wouldn't expect sort of a, you know, a, a, a Heppel white chair to have kind of, you know, the trendy Art Nouveau bits on the side. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't travel well, this system. It's, it's very much of a time and a place. Please mention, how did it die out? Why did it die out? Well, I mean, there are lots of reasons combined. I mean, uh, number one, uh, the most obvious one is the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, so uh, for about a, a generation, the wars raged throughout Europe over the, the French Revolution and its you know, consequences. And as a result of that, the French, um, uh, wherever they went, they broke the, the connection between church and education. So all the church schools were, were disbanded um, and uh, secular public schools were sort of put in their place. And so the, the wonderful ancient tradition of church education was broken. Uh, and also they outlawed castrati. They, they outlawed castration and the castrati. Uh, and after a generation, they couldn't teach and, you know, the spoken thing disappeared. But the, the, the real reason, I mean, the number one reason why it disappeared is a loss of patronage, because it's really um, a craft system uh, for bespoke industries for the church and aristocracy. And by the 1800s, neither of those institutions could afford to pay for their bespoke music industries. So the church could no longer afford to have these vast choirs and orchestras, you know, uh, in, in their churches. And similarly, the aristocracy could no longer afford to support their bands and orchestras in their houses. Um, and so the, the money was to be made with the new middle class selling music in sheet music or selling to the public. Uh, so the old craft traditions really just weren't needed anymore. Now, you've done stellar work in this field. It's fair to say that you've really unlocked the core mysteries around solfeggio. Are there more mysteries? And do you have questions after all the nine years of research that you've done? Are there still things that you are thinking about? Well, I was very flattered because um, I wrote to Bob Jerding about this when I discovered these traits in the manuscripts that show where the syllables were sung. And uh, he wrote back to me and said, uh, Nick, you've cracked the code, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is the, the most flattering thing I think anyone's ever said about my research. Uh, but yeah, so I, I sort of cracked the code, but I think I'm really just an infant when it comes to reading it. Uh, I think that there are a lot of secrets yet to be discovered. So, I mean, my level of understanding is is 
of let's say a, a kind of eight or nine year old <laughs> at a, a Neapolitan conservatoire. Um, uh, you know, I, I can do some basic stuff and I can understand and interpret, but there's an awful lot of this stuff which is beyond me, which which is far too complex or you know um, sophisticated for me. And also, uh, I mean, thousands of questions remain. Uh, it, it, it's not you know I've I've Give a cracked couple. this code if you like, but um, well just interpreting some extremely complex manuscripts i mean there are still multiple questions over how we actually understand these things because when there's no written evidence you know you you're, you you're, you have to be like a scientist you have to put forward the most plausible theory test it if it's wrong get rid of it or if you can amend it with practice uh, i think that actually uh, the most fascinating thing for me about this is how it's going to play out amongst performers and musicians and how they're going to use it so I, what I don't want is it for it to be just an academic discipline of interest to scholars of history. And they say, oh, oh, back in those days, that's what they did. I mean, for instance, think of Paganini. Yeah? Paganini uh, clearly uh, learned his tradition through solfeggio. He, you know, he's in, in the Tartini tradition where they would play the violin. They would play solfeggi on the violin. So if you play um, do, re, mi on a violin, how many thousands of ways can you play do, re, mi on a violin? You know, that's that's the Paganini tradition. Um uh, and, um, oh, shall I do you a little Paganini? I'll do you a Paganini trick Absolutely, if you like. Yeah. Would you like to hear this? Yeah. Um, right, so Paganini's most famous melody is a solfeggio, and it's a solfeggio that has the first five notes of a minor scale, which in solfeggio are not two, three, four, five, six. They're re, mi, fa, sol, la. And if I sing you uh, a quick solfeggio, ready? Re, la, re, la, re, la, re, la, la, sol, sol, fa, Fa, mi, mi, re, fa, mi, re. Very simple, yeah? Five to one. Listen to this. I'll do the same thing with the same syllables from the different hexachord. Re, la, re, la, la, sol, sol, fa, fa, mi, mi, re, fa, mi, re. And there we have uh, Paganini's most famous caprice. And it's actually a solfeggio with what we're called inganni, which are singing the wrong syllable to the, sorry, the wrong pitch to the right syllable. Oh, what does that mean, we're singing the wrong pitch to the right syllable? Well, every scale has two of each syllable. So there are two do's, there are two re's, and two mi's. So if I sing, for instance, fa, sol, fa, mi, yep, that's four, five, four, three, fa, sol, fa, mi. If I do the other sol, listen, fa, sol, fa, mi, yep, that, that's an inganno, that's a deception. It's it's a very common trick in 18th century solfeggio. So, um uh, someone, if someone like Paganini was doing that, what does that do for modern violinists? You know, if they now know that's what he did, if you say, well, okay, you have a simple solfeggio and you play it in a thousand different ways, uh, his Caprice number 24, there are not only 10 or 20 variations, there are 10,000 variations of that solfeggio. And what that will do to modern approaches to performance and, and ways of teaching, this is quite fascinating to me. And I don't have any answers. I don't have the answers. I'm just really keen to see what other musicians do with this information. Just to end maybe on a provocative note, you mentioned earlier that you discarded quite a bit of information that you didn't find useful when trying to interpret solfeggio and, and this sort of uh, tradition. You've gone through the training of a, of a conservatory and a, as a pianist. Now you've done the solfeggio. What are the things that you really feel like you've discarded uh, that people maybe should consider not putting so much emphasis on in, in conservatory training? Wow. <laughs> That's a big question. Um, well, I mean, I went through the, the usual conservatory system, which is still in place in, in, in you know in most parts of the world, where you basically learn to sonorize a score, which is inviolable. Um, you know, you, you're not allowed to change it. You can add a few ornaments if you're lucky, if you know how to do <laughs> if you're it. Lucky. You know, uh, you, know you, you, you add ornaments to the score. Um, and and I, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a tradition that has its own history and its own purposes. And, it, and there's a lot of beautiful music that is performed. And I don't have any problem with that. But I think there is an alternative. I, I, I think that there are ways of learning this music and playing it in a slightly more individual way um, and being slightly more creative and bringing back some of that creativity. So for instance, I, uh, it would be sacrilegious, but this is something I would do. If I were playing Mozart's Sonata, uh, the one that goes da, 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 that I sang earlier, if I'm going to sing La Sol Fa Mi, why would I do it in that way? Why would I do it the way Mozart did it? I, you know, I could do it in a different way that's actually better for me, that I play a better way. 
why not? You know, so so doing solfeggio changes your attitude, and I think that we've lost that creativity. Mozart would never expect anybody, in fact, even in uh, uh, amateurs that he was teaching, to play the music exactly as written on the page. He would expect them to personalize it, to put their own stamp on it. No kidding. That's what I would like to see. Well, on that note, Nicholas, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really enjoyed talking to you, and this has been really a mind-blowing conversation. Yeah, would you like to mention a few uh, events or projects or more research that are related to this or just other things that you are working on? We've got an exhibition in London in 2021 about this stuff, and there's all sorts of other things going on. We've got um, students at the Amsterdam Conservatorium and at Maastricht Conservatoire are working on this stuff. Uh, my students at Nottingham are too, so we've got students working on it already, which is feeding back uh, really amazing results. Um, I've got a, an Art of Solfeggio Facebook page, um, which um, is only just starting Started, but we're trying to put some interesting stuff on there and get discussions going and get people learning about this stuff. Um, and in 2021 at the Foundling Museum in London, uh, just near the British Museum, um, I've got an exhibition coming up called Street Kids to Superstars, which is all about how orphanages uh, were the X factor of their day. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, uh, Nicholas, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you for your amazing hard work and your stellar research in this area, and uh, have a great rest of the day. I'll hope to talk to you soon. Thank you, Nikhil. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this interview. I'm so honored to be able to talk to all of my guests. They are the best in the business. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you shared it on social media and hit subscribe for future guests. Check out NikhilHogan.com for updates on my upcoming book, Why Children Quit Music, and check out SongbirdMusicAcademy.com for free resources on how to learn music. Thanks again, and I'll see you at the next show. 